Um, so I'd like to begin by saying thank you. The acknowledgement here, I appreciate thank you, Anne, for reading the acknowledgement um, for the land that we are on. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to, to everyone here, um, the faculty and the students involved in inviting me to come back. This has been um, the cause of great anxiety and a great honor for myself to come back here to my alma mater and speak. So I just want to say thank you. But more importantly, I want to say thank you for this whole question, this, this series of questioning yourself, of critiquing yourself, you open yourself up to, um, to, to some very um, important questions uh, and the possibility for some very insightful critique, which I know uh, cannot be easy. Uh, so I'm thankful to be a part of that. Um, so let's begin, as Anne said, uh, we'll begin with the question, in the world of unprecedented possibilities and unforeseen brutalities, what can architectural education do? With its legacy of confronting difficult questions, how can cultural history evolve to embrace the complex cultural narratives of our global world? In my lecture, it's, um, there's, it's going to have different qualities. In my lecture, I'm going to talk about these themes, this idea of diversity, this idea of simultaneity, this idea of the open work, and the idea of gender. All of these issues, I think, are really important when we're talking about cultural history. And I believe that my education at Waterloo was both a gift and a liability. I was given many gifts on how to understand cultural history, how to use it and process it. But at the same time, there is so much room for so much more. Um, and so what I'm going to be sharing with you is not a solution, it's not an answer, it is simply my journey, what I've taken, how I've used these tools, how I've used these gifts to move forward in the world, and the kinds of questions I've asked throughout my career. Yes, it has been 25 years since I entered the school as an innocent first year student uh, in the tradition of um, every year. Uh, do you still do this? Do you still tell, take mug shots? Okay, fantastic. So, uh, they're what? They're only headshots. They're only headshots. Uh, so yes, very first day of classes, Frosh Week, you'll notice my very fashionable attire from the early 90s. Let's move on. Um, in my undergraduate education at, uh, at Waterloo, I was fortunate uh, to be exposed to a number of things. And what I'm showing you are some of the moments that lie some in the margins. So the moments that lie outside the typical curriculum uh, here at Waterloo. Uh, this is an image, um, I was fortunate enough to join uh, Rick Haldenby and Rosemary Aker, uh, Kathy and Joy twice. Uh, we went to Carthage, Tunisia for an archaeological dig. Our role here was to process the history that we were in. We were measuring the ruins of a, of a Roman Odeon and then with our technology and um, analog and digital we, we, were, uh, uh, we were to reconstruct based on the ruins, uh, what existed. So it was, it was an extraordinary term. And, and as I show you images of what I did at Waterloo and what I learned, I'll always couple them with images of um, what came out of my sketchbooks. Because for me, the sketchbook is that open work. It's the open work where I process cultural history, but where I also process design. It's this intermediary space between understanding really complex ideas, some of them historical. They don't just belong on the shelf. And then how those can be translated into contemporary thoughts and contemporary design and all of that. Uh, Rome, late 90s, uh, and images from my sketchbook of when I was working through a project there. Um, it, back, back in the day, <laughs> uh, we did the B-Arch thesis, so this was a, a six-year program, uh, and this is uh, Bodius thesis for my um, B-Arch graduation project, which was submission. I had proposed the design of a mosque in Waterloo, and in order to understand this process, I started making installations and doing drawings and sketching, and of course, um, trying to understand what it was. And the reason why I bring this up now is throughout my, throughout my undergrad, I kept asking the same questions over and over again in my cultural history course. So when do we get to other stuff? We kept talking about the West, which is fantastic. So this is what I mean about the gifts and the liabilities of my undergraduate education at Waterloo. The gift was I learned how to process primary materials. The gift was I was, extra I was exposed to extraordinary materials, to extraordinary teachers, to the ability to critique. In first year, I was given the gift of learning how to critique. We take it for granted here, but it's not something that you learn in other schools. I learned that right away when I started um, taking courses at Wilfrid Laurier, that that's not the norm. So that was the gift. I learned how to question, I learned how to ask, but the liability was I wasn't exposed to anything that was not Eurocentric. It was a Eurocentric education. It was completely Western, and I kept asking, so where do I fit in? So where do I fit in? Does my identity matter? Does the things that I know matter? Do, do the things that I've seen even have any relevance to architecture? I was told a couple of times that no, not directly, not necessarily. Yes, sometimes, maybe, in a way, okay, 
but never on the screen, never in class, never in content. It was never curated in my six years of undergrad. Uh, and I remember at one point, a uh, professor here, uh, Richard Slifka, because I kept asking these questions, and he said to me, oh, Tammy, if you want to know this stuff, go and learn it. And I did. I went and learned it, and I came back. Um, and so it was a question for my undergraduate thesis. It was naive. I go back and I look at my research. I love it. I love my research. I love what I did, but it was so naive, right? And I was just trying to investigate these ideas and this research, and I kept wondering, where do I go forth from here? I graduated from Waterloo in 1999. I moved to Cairo, Egypt for a number of personal reasons, but it was an opportunity to kind of learn about a culture that I had never learned about at all. Right? Uh, I spent a number of years there. I completed a master's and a PhD at Cairo University. My PhD was titled The Space and Place of Women in Mosque Architecture Between Realities and Misconceptions. Uh, I spent years surveying. This is one of the photographs I took. This is at one, uh, the oldest, one of the oldest mosques in Cairo. Sorry, I went ahead. How did that go ahead? Okay, this is at the Al-Azhar Mosque, um, and what I did was, for a number of years, I surveyed historical mosques, and I kept trying to poke my finger in this question of, so why are the women's spaces so terrible in mosques, right? I grew up with this, and I kept putting it on the back burner when I was in architecture school. I thought, well, we're not being taught about this, so maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe that's the way it is. And in my PhD, what I did was I kept investigating, kept reading, kept looking. I looked at historical buildings. I looked at contemporary buildings. It led me back to starting to read primary sources. So this is the gift from my undergraduate education here. Went back to primary readings. I started reading uh, the Quran, the Ahadith. I started asking for fatwa from different <coughs> governments. And I started interpreting and analyzing uh, both, both text and architectural remains. It was an extraordinary journey to take upon it. A lot of it was like any good PhD, a lot of self-education, a lot of self-critique. Um, I finished in 2007. As I was as I was researching, I was also teaching full time. Uh, again, another gift is to kind of teach. I will never forget uh, the lessons of Rome, not necessarily because of the content of Rome, but it was the way, right? Uh, Rick Holmby standing for 12 hours at a time, to walking us through the forum. For me, that was a gift. And it was a gift that I thought, okay, this is the way I want to teach. In an odd way, when I showed up at MIU in Cairo to teach, um, all of their history courses were inside the classroom, every single one. And I thought, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So uh, it's a 14-week uh, semester. I would spend seven to eight of those lectures in the street. Just meet me, meet me at these buildings. And we would walk and walk. And it depended on our luck, what mosques happened to be open, what buildings were open that day. And those are the ones we went in, and those are the ones I lectured about. And it became an education for myself and for my students. And I was learning as I was teaching. It was a complete thrill. And I was sharing with them what I was finding in my PhD. And so we would be in the mosque, and I would give a lecture, uh, the call to prayer. And I'd say, students, if you want to pray, go ahead. And if you don't, just step outside. That's fine with me. Or just keep sketching or do what you do. Um, and as I was lecturing to my students, I'd often sit right in the middle of, of the space of the mosque. Sometimes I'd sit on the podium. Uh, but the call to prayer, we'd turn, and we'd look. And we'd see a makeshift kind of construction of bed sheets or um, plywood, just kind of haphazardly put in the corner and I was told okay that's where the women go but historically that's not where the women went historically the men and women shared the space without architectural barrier unfortunately recent kind of modifications or um, understandings or interpretations have led to this and I'd look and I'd just be so disappointed and my male students would be like doctor I'd be like yes and they're like what do you want us to do <laughs> um, and we went, I went about it and it became a part of the critique and I was able to share what my critique was in a real way with my students and I am so, so thankful for those years that I spent in Cairo uh, I taught a course that I developed at um, the American University in Cairo it's a traditional arts course and what it was, was I wanted to start discovering the immaterial arts Right, the traditions, the tradition of drawing geometry uh, using only analog methods and what those geometries meant. I took the students on field trips to see the historic mosques, synagogues, and churches of Cairo. Something funny going on here. And, um, and while we were there, the students would make discoveries like, oh, those are the same geometries used throughout interpreted differently. Uh, throughout the semester, we'd spend hours and hours drawing the different systems, and then their final project was an installation. Now, these were not architecture students. These are general students interested in a topic. This is a special course that was just done uh, as an elective. A colleague of mine was developing a similar course, and the two of us decided to submit our research for a research competition to the UIA, the International Union of Architects, 2011. It was awarded first place, and we went and shared our findings uh, there. 
uh, my years of Egypt, uh, I, was happy, I was happy to be able to kind of summarize them in a, in a way when I was invited to write a chapter for this uh, college textbook used in, the United, in different parts of the United States. Uh, the college textbook is called Diversity and Design Perspectives from the Known Western World, and I was invited to write the chapter on Egypt where I wrote um, just under 100 pages, taking you from ancient Egypt all through to contemporary Egypt, and what influenced that. The slides are giving away what I'm saying. Ah, all right. Uh, in 2011, uh, shortly after the revolution, I did find life unbearable in Egypt, and for personal reasons, I came back home to my alma mater, um, and I was, and I covered for Anne Bordelot in her uh, um, second year cultural, pardon me? Maternity leave, yes. Um, so I covered the cultural history course for second year. Wow. Um, so coming back home to teach was uh, really kind of overwhelming and exciting. So I got to to, to teach a number of the students who I taught are actually here today. Um, it's kind of a full circle moment in many ways to be here. Um, and I decided to change the course. And Anne, I remember right off the bat, said, you know, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. And I looked at the course, and it hadn't changed too much from the time that I took it. So the course is medieval history. All of you have taken it, right? Uh, covering a certain period in time. And almost always it's curated with, you know, 100% Western readings and the study of Western buildings. And I thought, okay, well, the, the, the Crusades in the medieval era did not just happen isolated in one part of the world. So I changed things up a bit and included some other readings. We got to read some primary readings from the other side of things. Um, and we looked at 11th century works by writers and historians. And we also looked at buildings uh, um, from the other side of things as well. Uh, an important part in, in the way I teach cultural history, the way I process cultural history, like I've shown you in my sketchbooks, is the making, the palpable qualities, right? This is the part where it becomes an open work, right? Open work is a book written by my very favorite author, Umberto Eco, um, and he writes this book, uh, this theory of the open work is a work that can remain open to interpretation, alive through that act, rather than static uh, and frozen within a particular interpretation. And so I believe that through the model making process, the students would engage in the open work of the material they were studying by translating um, material that they'd found in research to be able to construct these models. They were getting closer and closer to the idea of the building uh, in many different ways. Uh, these are a few of the models. This one still remains on display in the library, the Hagia Sophia. Itself is a story of you know, change uh, from the Byzantine to the Muslim to, to the non-religious non today. When you go and see it, it is a kind of a museum to both. Um, they were charged with not only making the model out of comparable materials and understanding those systems, but they were charged with splitting the model down the middle and having to tell a different story with each side of the model. Uh, they then exhibited them all side by side, all at the same scale. And a conversation was to be had between the Great Mosque of Damascus, San Vitale, and the monastery at St. Catherine's. And so this idea of the canon, quote unquote, I blew it wide open. Who decides the canon? According to what is important to what era? Well, by maybe blowing it open and allowing kind of other buildings that aren't traditionally considered part of the canon, the conversation can start to become more fulsome. The interaction between, for example, these religions at this time wasn't just through war, but there was a cultural interaction, right? There were trade going on, and the influence on architecture was back and forth. And so this is part of one of the many lessons that I'd wanted to teach in the way I taught the cultural history. Uh, later on, it was published um, in this paper and then featured in this book on architectural pedagogy. In 2013, I developed an elective course. I took a number of students to Cappadocia and Istanbul for a week. Um, it was, at the time, the only safe place we could go to in the region. Uh, it was an extraordinary week where we got to visit a number of buildings, including ones that are not open to the public, that require a lot of petitioning, a lot of negotiating, and just a really, really thick head. Uh, we, this is Aya Ayrin. Uh, it is uh, the church that is uh, right behind Aya Sophia. It is um, the only iconoclastic church in Istanbul. Uh, never, uh, never converted into a mosque, was used as a place to kind of uh, store um, artillery by the Ottomans. Um, and even in its era, it was iconoclastic. So we don't have uh, the kind of the layering that we see in Hagia Sophia that we all love to uh, uh, talk about and analyze. But here we have the raw building, the raw qualities of the building, the kind of monumental translation between the Roman and the early Byzantine. So we got to spend a little bit of time in there. Um, 
in, by 2013, I'd accepted an offer to teach up north at a brand new school of architecture, uh, Canada's first uh, in over 40 years. Uh, we're looking at a complete uh, drone photograph. I think this is from the Facebook page of the school. Uh, Laurentian School of Architecture in Sudbury, Ontario. Um, and it's housed in these, con in these two converted buildings, the former telegraph building uh, and the former um, shed for the, for the trains. Uh, the new buildings are added, designed by Levitt Goodman Architect, and it's now become a complete campus. Uh, photograph from the green roof looking down at the, the campus between and a photograph looking at the studios. Um, if you look at any kind of webinar or history of the school, they strongly cite Waterloo as an inspiration. Wa Rick was invited to come up and talk about what Waterloo is and how it transformed Galt and the importance of having a campus of architecture in the downtown and not necessarily where the main campus is. And that's the case here with Laurentian. Um, I will say that it has been an extraordinary five years teaching at Laurentian, not necessarily because of the facilities, they're good, but it's been the opportunity to again teach to teach cultural history, uh, to teach studio, and this is the other, the, the back to the idea of the open work of, as a, as a professor, and as, as a pedagogue, I firmly believed in keeping a foot in the design world and a foot in the cultural history world, and how do the conversations come back and forth. So I teach in both programs. Um, I've developed a first year cultural history course, first year, uh, this is all analog, um, and the cultural history course is called Sacred Places. Um, so Sacred Places is just an introduction to cultural history. Every year I feature different religions, um, and what I do is I feature a religion. Uh, we look at the primary reading for the religion. I go through a couple of buildings, uh, a couple of material works for each of the religions. Uh, and in that way, what I try to frame is something that is not hierarchical or linear, but something that is simultaneous, right? The simultaneous development of different cultures, and it's not comprehensive but is simply exposure that reflects the kind of nature and the diversity of the student body that we have and that we and the world that exists after you graduate uh, from school. Uh, again, they do models, but here we didn't have equipment early on uh, in the students, and even then we decided analog. First year, it's all going to be analog. Uh, so these models are analog. Actually, one of the students who worked on that is here, Danny. Shout out to Danny. She's here somewhere. Where are you? Embarrass you a little bit. Uh, longhouse, hi to Longhouse. Uh, this is, again, the models are to come apart and tell a story, uh, detail from the Dome of the Rock. However, after a couple of years, I decided that maybe the final project isn't a study of a historical building. And maybe it isn't about building these massive models, but maybe it's about translating ideas to the contemporary. Where else are the students going to get exposed to the idea of contemporary sacred architecture? Right? And so uh, instead, for the past three years, what I've done is I've developed a list of contemporary sacred buildings. The students then have to apply what they've learned in my course, which is exclusively historical, apply the methods and the content to analyze in written form um, a contemporary sacred building and do a detailed model of a portion of the building. So in that way, kind of making that connection and that leap between uh, these notions of ideas that should not you know, sit collecting dust on some shelf, but can become kind of like a lesson in the first concept of design, right? Uh, throughout history, the greatest buildings throughout history have been sacred buildings. Why is this something that is not discussed anymore in our the, um, analysis of contemporary buildings? So this is a, a sectional model of a mosque in San Kaklar uh, done by one of my students. Uh, this mosque is uh, partially underground and he's created this model out of slate. This is a, a study of, um, from the Altash Cemetery uh, by Andre Nimish. Uh, and uh, that's um, uh, lap jointed wood uh, and then pigmented concrete that he's used. And then this is from the Water Moon Monastery uh, for 37 hours, Courtney hot knifed and cut out every single letter uh, from this wall. The beautiful thing about this one, I've kept it in my office and it still operates, right? That's the great thing about models, right? They're palpable, they force you to think about a building in a material way, you're touching it, you're thinking about it, and then in a funny way they act like the building. So it's sitting in my window all year long and I watch the shadows as the sacred words are cast in my office all year long. Um, this past fall, I developed our uh, content for our first graduate cohort. So we've graduated a cohort already, um, and now we're starting with our graduate school. And I decided to kind of bring in all these lessons that I've had of cultural history, of material knowledge, of analog geometry, and I developed um, a master's studio where first I took the students on a journey of de understanding different families of geometry. So geometry comes in families, families of three, six, 
four, eight, all the even multiples, and then the odd multiples become even more complex families. We stayed within that even multiples of the families of geometry. We learned how to draw using only a straight edge and a compass, um, how these families related. Once we, we learned that, um, we went to Iceland for one week. Um, and you'll understand why the geometry is so important. Because um, if you've ever been to Iceland, you'll know that the one of the important formations of the landscape there are these basalt rocks. These basalt uh, rocks are hexagonal. Uh, the hexagonal form, there it is kind of broken apart. You can see the size of, of one of those pieces uh, next to a student. Um, that hexagonal geometry has informed so much of the contemporary architecture in Iceland. So for, from the tallest church, the Halgrimskirkja, to the recent construction of the Harpa uh, of Olafur Eliasson, uh, we see the role of this kind of hexagon being interpreted over and over again into geometry and being connected, and how connected the buildings are to the landscape. Uh, at the Harpa, even the concrete is tinted black with the lava rock that's in Iceland. So the studio uh, was to design, I asked my students to design a sacred space in Iceland. They had to choose the religion, they had to research it, figure out you know, um, what were the numbers. I'll tell them to you right away. Iceland's 99% Lutheran, okay? So all the other religions coming in, they had to make a case for how does this religious space make a space, how does it connect to the specificity of the, la of the landscape in Iceland, and all these kind of questions of cultural history and design come together throughout the semester. Um, we also visited the studio of Olafur Eliasson while we were there. And here, this is a really lovely floor. Uh, this is a study of using only local materials of the basalt, the lava rock, and the dolerite, and this kind of complex geometry that he's created, uh, relating them together. Uh, this is an attempt at a selfie. I am in the mirror there. So that's my entire graduate studio. Uh, so I asked throughout the semester. So again, it's, it's not about a solution. And it's not necessarily about the content. It was about a method. And what I really wanted to teach my students in this M1 studio was a method of research. So the first step in the method of research is I asked them, research existing buildings and research the religion. Give me numbers, make a case. Uh, the next step was obviously the geometry that we looked at. But importantly, the next step in research is that primary. How do you process the site? How do you process existing buildings? How do you process things that you've seen, the phenomenological qualities, right? Uh, so that was the next step in the research. Uh, following that, they started to create, um, I asked the students before we even designed a building to um, sketch in vignette form what they imagined the experience of uh, worship would be in their buildings. And a lot of the students capitalized on the, on the landscape, on the mountains, and appropriated them within the kind of iconography that they were creating in their contemporary designs. This is a design, um, uh, the idea of a design for a Buddhist temple. In the background are the mountains. You can't quite see them, but we'll see them in another slide. The mountains, and she's appropriated them as the sacred mountains into the landscape of this uh, particular building. On her final project here. Uh, very quickly, I'll just show you a few things. Uh, recently, this is a publication on uh, troglodyte and timber dwellings uh, that I've um, that has come out in this vernacular um, uh, encyclopedia. Um, so I come back to this idea of uh, what I was researching for my PhD, and I kept investigating it now and here and what it meant um, until about 2015. I put together a proposal for a grant. The plan was I've never gotten a grant before. So the plan was I was going to write this and I was going to learn from how they were rejecting me because I really didn't think I was going to get it. I did get it and that was a really big surprise. Uh, Harper was in government at the time and I didn't think that the Canadian government would want me to study the mosques of Canada. I did get it uh, and in the space of two years I traveled to 53 cities and I visited 90 mosques. I documented a century of Muslim construction in Canada. This has never been done before. Uh, when I looked for it I couldn't find it and that's why I wrote the grant. Um, these are some of the images of the mosques I visited. And again, the process I use in these, in this, for me, research is this live thing between design and making and drawing and reading and seeing. Um, so I visited mosques all over the country. This is the first mosque built in Canada, by the way, 1938 in Edmonton. It's now in the Fort Edmonton Park as part of a history. Uh, and for every mosque, uh, one of my research assistants, who's here also, Jessica, um, we created these plans for each one. And you'll see we marked in gray the space for men, in red the space for women, and the yellow box is the Qibla. So the whole orientation became a big debate, and I have this huge study coming out of it. I went up north twice. Uh, the first time I went beyond the Arctic Circle by 200 kilometers to... Um, 
Inuvik. Uh, and the second time I just went up uh, to this mosque, which was completed in Iqaluit. Um, you know, not, not fantastic, not exciting buildings. Often when I go see a mosque, they'd be like, oh, but they're not beautiful. Why do you want to study them? I'm like, but it's not about how it looks. It's about what it means, and it's about who paid for it, and it's about the role it plays in the community. It's about the history um, of these spaces. Uh, the project that I completed the survey last year uh, had an exhibition um, at the Noor Cultural Center, which is a converted building designed by Raymond Moriyama. used to be the Japanese Cultural Center, and now it is an Islamic <laughs> cultural center with a mosque in it. Um, what you're looking at are panels that I created uh, that critique gender. So I haven't had a chance. This is a very short lecture, and if I'm over time, I'm sorry. Um, um, I have been, I've been very interested when I teach... When I teach cultural history, I bring in the voices of women. I look at women writers and women architects. I talk about the spaces for women from the very beginning. Um, and when I research, this has been an important part right, um, of, of what I'm researching. Um, documenting these 90 mosques has been overwhelming. Right? The point was to remain unbiased and to record as much as I could. However, I was having these visceral reactions Inside a number of these mosques, in fact, <laughs> according to my statistics, inside 75% of them, there was a clear separation between men and women. Inside 50% of them, there wasn't even a view of the men's space or the main space for the women. And so this visceral reaction over and over again, the different methods used to kind of separate and segregate women um, and, uh, inspired me to start making making again. So I started sketching and making because the photographs really weren't describing what I, what, what, what I was going through. Um, these are panels that I made, um, mixed media. I always use um, uh, kind of a collage of red strips that are pulled out of Vogue magazine. Red is, you know, the color of blood, the color of menstruation, the color of women, the color of life, the color of childbirth. I uh, use it to weave a rug out of pieces of lips, of fabric, of hair, of items that I find associated with the feminine in magazines, and I appropriate them and use them as the kind of orientation of color in my pieces, and the rest remain largely an accurate representation of the proportions and the experience of the women's space. Here we're looking at one in Red Deer Mosque where, yes, that is a narrow room on an angle that is impossible to pray in, and on top of that are mirrored windows, so I don't even see the main space, I see myself, another layer of alienation. Um, this one is in a converted uh, church in Fredericton, uh, and the process I make these is often the process that, that is, again, analogous to the space. Um, and so first I depict the perspective of the space, so the main space or the men's space. Um, layered on top of that is a railing, right? Layered on top of that are uh, literal veils and curtains separating the space between men and women. And so what you see is just a kind of a ghost of the space. Uh, and again, I have the unifying element of the orientation of the red. And so what, what, I've, what I've decided to share with you tonight is, is a glimpse. It's, it's simply a glimpse of how I've used my 25 years of understanding and processing and questioning cultural history, uh, both in my pedagogy and in my, in my personal research. Uh, the, some of the questions I've tried to answer, uh, some of the questions I'll poise back to Waterloo and poise back to, to the curriculum, is that exposure to the other, exposure to beyond the West, beyond Eurocentric context, is fundamentally important for how we process ourselves, right? Uh, if we don't see ourselves in the curriculum, then we find ourselves almost... Um, Maybe the word is separate, undervalued, outside, maybe behind the veil. Thank you very much.